for the Hoover Institution in Washington, D.C. There are 100 members of the United States Senate, but if you had to name one who knows more about energy policy and is more responsible for energy policy than any of the 99 others, he would be our guest today, the senior senator from North Dakota, John Hoven. Uncommon knowledge now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Born in Bismarck, John Henry Hoven III grew up in Minot, graduated from Dartmouth College, earned his MBA at Northwestern, and then went home to work with his father at the First Western Bank and Trust of Minot, where he had been helping to keep the books since he was 15 years old. After a dozen years at the family bank in Minot, Mr. Hoven became head of the Bank of North Dakota. In 2000, Mr. Hoven ran for governor of North Dakota, defeating his Democratic opponent by 55 to 44 percent. Ten points, sounds like a healthy margin. Then the people of North Dakota got to know him. In 2004, Governor Hoven was re-elected, this time defeating his Democratic opponent by 71 to 28 percent. In 2008, he was re-elected once again, this time defeating his Democratic opponent by 74 to 24 percent. And as, as of late 2009, his last full year in office as governor, Governor Hoven's approval rating stood at an astonishing 87 percent. Having served in the governor's mansion for a decade, in 2010, Governor Hoven ran for the United States Senate, and he won this race by defeating his Democratic challenger by 76 to 22 percent. Senator Hoven's committee assignments include the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources and the Appropriations Committee, where he serves as chairman of the subcommittee on the Department of Homeland Security. Senator John Hoven, one of the most experienced and most popular office holders in the nation, welcome. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for that very nice introduction. I've known you for a long time. I have to say, if those not, good Lord, what's John been up to? Good for you. Well, it's great to be with you. Two quotations, Senator both Barack Obama, presidential candidate Barack Obama in 2008, quote, what I will not do is support a plan that suggests drilling is the answer to our energy problems. It won't drop prices in this administration or the next administration or the administration after that, close quote. President Barack Obama in the 2014 State of the Union address, just a couple of months ago up on the Hill, quote, more oil is produced here at home than we buy from the rest of the world. That's the first time that's happened in nearly 20 years. The president also made reference to gas prices dropping by some 40% since last September. Candidate Obama said, no, never. President Obama says, look at all this good news about energy. What happened, Senator? Well, we're producing so much more oil and gas in our country. But the reality is we're producing it on private land and on state land. Uh, that production has gone up about 60 percent during uh, this administration's time in office. But actually production on federal lands has gone down. It's gone down by 6 percent. So overall we're up about 40 percent in total production. But because of what we're doing on state and private land, uh, the president actually has made it harder to produce energy on, on public land. So, so it irks, it's, it's, it's it really in spite. Credit. Right. It's in spite of what he's doing. So can you explain for a layman, Senator, Tell me about fracking, horizontal drilling and fracking. Those are the two big technologies that we've seen make a big difference in the last five, six, seven years. Isn't that right? Can you just explain them for me? Sure. That's really what's unlocked the Bakken, which is uh, you know, North Dakota, Montana, some in Canada. But these shale plays, uh, particularly for oil, like the Eagleford in Texas, the Bakken, and then also for gas, the Marcellus and the Utica in the eastern part of the country in Pennsylvania. Marcellus is Pennsylvania, upstate New York. Right. And uh, Utica is Ohio. So the two things you said, are that's the new technology that's really made it work. Directional drilling enables you to not only drill down vertically, but then go out in any direction that you want. Hydraulic fracturing allows you to fracture the rock formation once you're in the pay zone, and then the oil or the gas comes into the well bore and you bring it up. That's what's made it economical to produce oil and natural gas in this country and why we're now the leader in natural gas and soon to be the leader in oil production in the world. So almost every step of this conversation where we're going to talk about production, we all, there's always an environmental question. 
horizontal drilling, what is the, the correct term is directional drilling. Horizontal That's, drilling or directional okay. drilling, either one. And the fracking, mm -hmm. the environmental impact? Really, How better, better environmental stewardship. We've been doing hydraulic fracturing. I think it was originally started in Oklahoma in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, but, uh, you know, both actually reduce uh, the environmental impact of producing oil and gas in the country. And then, as, if I recall correctly, the year before last, what was it, 40 nations signed the Kyoto Protocol promising to decrease their, the emission of greenhouse gases? We refused to sign that protocol, but we're the only nation that has reduced its emission of greenhouse gases because of shifting from oil to natural gas. If I got that correct? We're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions because of the technology that we're developing, and that's been my contention all along. We've shown it in North Dakota. We need to do it as a country. That's the right kind of energy plan for our country. If we empower this investment into energy development rather than blocking it with regulations. We not only get deployment of the new technologies that will produce more energy more cost effectively, but we'll also get better environmental stewardship. We not only reduce greenhouse gases, we actually reduce the environmental footprint on the ground. That's the way to build an energy plan for this country that works. New York Times editorial board. I'm sure you leap from bed every morning to read the New York Times editorials argues that tar oil, tar sands oil, I'm wading into quicksand here for me because the technical stuff of this, you know far better, you'll correct me if I make a mistake. Tar sands oil yields about a six more greenhouse gas than conventional crude. Quote, quoting the New York Times editorial, mainstream climate scientists are virtually unanimous in saying that as much as two thirds of the world's deposit of fossil fuels must remain in the ground if climate disaster is to be avoided Alberta's tar sands oil, Alberta, Canada, the very stuff that would be shipped through this pipeline, if you get your way, Alberta's tar sands oil should be among the first such deposits we decide to leave alone, close quote. Okay, so what's the, what's the argument there? What's the counter argument to the environmental assault? Right, well, first off, uh, we're importing crudes, uh, like from Venezuela, that have as high uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, even oil that we produce in California, for example, heavy crudes out of California, have uh, similar greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, you have to look at the technology development. The uh, advancement of technologies enable us, to, or enable Canada, to produce the oil sands with lower greenhouse gas emissions. Both Shell and Exxon have major projects going on up there, major investments in new technologies that they're deploying right now that include carbon capture and storage that bring that greenhouse gas footprint down so that it's on a par with uh, all of the oil uh, that essentially is refined uh, in the country. That's my point, is that the technology is how you address that issue, not by blocking the very investment that produces more energy with better environmental stewardship. And now let's go back to the report itself, mm -hmm. prepared by the State Department, the Environmental Impact Statement. There were, I believe, uh, three draft statements and two final environmental impact. So in all five for a while, right. environmental impact statements. Finding no significant environmental impact. And in fact, that with the pipeline, greenhouse gas emissions are lower than without it. Because instead of moving the, uh, the, the oil we, will be produced either way. The question is, do you move it by pipe or do you move it by train? If you move it by train, that's 1,400 rail cars a day. Or if you build a pipeline to the West Coast, which Canada is looking at doing, and it goes to China, you have to move it on tankers, goes to refineries in China that have higher emissions, and we continue to import oil, like from Venezuela that has just as high a greenhouse gas, and we have to bring it in on tankers, so you have more greenhouse gas emissions without the pipeline. All right. And again, this, this isn't, that's not just my argument. That's the Obama administration's own report. Okay. Senator, you are the, you sit on the Appropriations Committee, arguably the most powerful committee in the Senate, and you are chairman of the subcommittee on the Department of Homeland Security. You are right in the middle of budgeting for, and therefore all the central issues on Homeland Security. We continue, John Hoven gets his way. The pipeline goes through, three, four years from now, we're importing no oil. 
let's suppose. Plus exports, export, export natural oil. gas. Let's, let's have a We're, growing economy and good jobs. And what effect does that have on the national security of this nation? Well, think about it. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. Look at what's going on with ISIS. Look at uh, Putin's aggression in the Ukraine. Look what's going on in Europe. We're in a position to not only produce more energy than we need in terms of oil and gas, okay, but also to be able to export it and help our allies, help reduce the dependence of Europe on Russian oil and gas, to tell the Middle East we don't need energy from the Middle East. And look what it does for our economy. Energy is a foundational industry. When we have low-cost, dependable energy, every other industry sector is stronger. Our manufacturing, our chemical, petrochemical industries, across the board, high-tech, you name it. We win in the global competition when we have low-cost, dependable energy, and we are much more secure when it comes to geopolitical issues like we're seeing right now in the Middle East and, and in Eastern Europe. So produce more energy at home because it starves the bastards. This is why Americans overwhelmingly support Keystone. They get it. This is the common sense of Americans across this great country that say, yes, we want energy security. It's a win, whether you're talking jobs, economic growth, national security, and as we've just talked about, we can't export our regulations. You know, even if President Obama wants to push, put all these regulations in place, that doesn't mean the rest of the world follows those regulations. But if we develop these technologies like we're doing, the rest of the world will develop those technologies. So we're also solving the environmental concern the right way. All right. Intel. Retired CIA officer Henry Crumpton writing in the Wall Street Journal earlier this mm -hmm. week. Quote, it is alarming enough to see the rapid advance of radical Islamist armed groups, but the paralysis in Washington exemplified by the Department of Homeland Security budget deadline, we'll come to that, that's right in your bailiwick, yeah. compounds the crisis. He talks about losing forward listening posts when we closed our embassies in Yemen and Libya, and he talks about the Senate torture report uh, engaging in, quote, his terms, unseemly abuse of the CIA, the result of all of this, mm -hmm. quote, U.S. intelligence probably knows less about the enemy's plans and intentions than at any point since 9-11. Senator? One of the things that we're going to have to find a way to sustain it and do a better job of sustaining is our human intelligence. We do technology so well, and we've got to maintain that techno technological advantage in all aspects of what we do from a military and from covert operations standpoint, but we've got to have human resources too. And you're identifying a number of incidents where you know, we're losing some of that human intelligence on the ground. That is a vital part of national security. And we've got to sustain that, and we've got to do a better job of sustaining that. So I'm assuming your, your subcommittee gets closed door briefings on what's going on and where, where the budget, how, what's your feeling? Is there a job of rebuilding, rapid rebuilding that's necessary? We, or are we in pretty good shape with regard to Intel? We do, many, Intel, things, we do th many things very well. But we've, as I say, we've got to not only continue to sustain the technological advantage, we've got to have human resources on the ground. And that's part of what we're dealing with right now as we work to build a coalition you know, in the region. So that's a vital part of it. So this piece mentioned the Homeland Security budget. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure I will get the details of this sideways because it's complicated, but to object to President Obama's immigration measures, Congress in the last session funded the Department of Homeland Security only through early this year, if I have that correct. End of February. End of February, the end of this very month. Mm -hmm. And so you folks and you as the chairman of the subcommittee on the Department of Homeland Security, I imagine a lot of this is going right through your office have to decide, do we give them a clean bill now that, that, now that a judge in Texas has put a stay on the Obama administration's plan to permit illegal immigrants to stay here? Do we give them a little extension and keep negotiating? Do we just give them a clean butt? What are you gonna do? How well, are you gonna fund Homeland let, let, Security? Let's start, yeah, I mean, let's start with where we are. Please. The simple fact is our colleagues on the other side of the aisle are filibustering our ability to get on a bill that would fully fund the Department of Homeland Security. And I think the you people- You have introduced a bill that would fully fund? The House passed, the House passed a bill on a bipartisan basis that will fully fund the Department of Homeland Security. Fully funds it. 
in the Senate, Democrats are filibustering us even going to that bill. We'll vote on it again today. We'll vote again to, say, to get on the bill. We'll provide open amendment process so our colleagues can offer the amendments they want to have. We're just trying to get on the bill. We're being filibustered. What's the, what are they thinking? What's the tack? What are they trying well, to do? Well, of course, they're filibustering it because the bill includes an amendment that would block the president's executive order. So they're oh, willing to filibuster funding for Homeland Security just to Even protect though that's in the, the courts president. Already. Just to protect the president's executive order on immigration, which exceeds his authority under the Constitution. So that's the reality that people have to understand. The filibuster is on the Democrat side, on a, not even allowing us to go to the House bill that fully funds the Department of Homeland Security and understand, at the end of the day, you can't just pass a bill through the Senate. It's going to have to pass through the House, too. That's why it's important for people to understand what's going on. Okay, last question on national security. We've been discussing... We've been discussing problems that can be fixed or actions that can be reversed. You can add more human intel. It may be difficult. It may take a long time. It may be expensive, but it can be done. If the administration reaches an agreement with Iran that permits Iran, and these are the terms that now seem to be in play, that permits Iran to come within one year of developing a nuclear weapon, and then the Saudis decide, wait a minute, we can't live, we need that ourselves. And the Egypt will say, well, we need it. And as Dr. Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, testified to the Armed Services Committee, not your committee, but I know you know those fellows, last month, we will then live in a proliferated world in which country after country has its finger on the nuclear trigger. That action by the Obama administration could not be reversed. Is there a sense in the Senate that somehow you must prevent that? Is there a sense in the Senate that this could be a crisis? We're very concerned. Right now, the administration is working towards an agreement with Iran. We're worried that the agreement will not be a good agreement. That will, it will essentially allow Iran to get to a point where, as you say, they could break out and have a nuclear weapon in very short order. That is not acceptable. Not acceptable. Full stop. Right. And that is why we're pushing to make sure that any agreement that uh, is entered into by the administration comes to the Senate uh, for an up or down vote. We think that is vitally important. And how many Democrats have you got? I know you've got Bob Menendez of New Jersey. There's a prominent Democrat who agrees with you on that. What's well, remember, it would take you know 67 votes in order to ratify the agreement. So I think we'd be in very strong shape. If it's not a bona fide agreement, it will not be ratified. And that's why it's so important that it come to the Senate for ratification. Otherwise, we could end up with a very bad agreement that puts us at greater risk. And as you identified in your question, it's not just Iran. We're very concerned about Iran getting a nuclear weapon, but that's going to start a nuclear weapons race, as you alluded to, in the Middle East. Saudis, Egyptians, you know, they're not going to just allow Iran to have a nuclear device and the other countries not have it. So this is, it's an existential threat. It is a huge problem. And the mistake that the administration made is in 2011, we passed a bill, which was the Kirk Menendez bill, that put biting sanctions on Iran because it stopped the banking system. No country or business could do business with Iran and our banking system. Right. That prevented Iran from selling its oil because they couldn't get paid for it. They felt incredible pressure. Their economy was tanking, and that's why they wanted to come to the table. That was precisely the, the time for the administration to say, yes, we'll negotiate, but those sanctions will stay in place unless and until you give us an agreement that is acceptable to us. Instead, the administration relieved the sanctions. Absolutely the wrong thing to do because sanctions by their nature take time to work, and when you let up, the relief is immediate. And so now we find ourselves in this very troubling situation why it's very important that any agreement, any agreement needs to come to the Senate for ratification because we are better without an agreement than having a, a bad agreement. Okay. Um, he, ha he has another couple of years in office. You, Leader McConnell, your colleagues on the Republican side are trying to return the Senate to proper working order. Regular order. To regular order, to upholding the Constitution of the United States, to, ad, to advancing a, an agenda that can show the American people what it could be like right. if they elect a Republican in 2016. Barack Obama's ratings have been drifting upward 
recently. He's at about 50%. 50% sounds so-so by comparison with your own numbers back in North Dakota. But 50% is pretty good by comparison with, with the approval rating for Congress, which is about 16%. Does Congress have enough of a voice in the national conversation, frankly, enough attention in the press to get heard? I know you get heard in this town because you come give interviews to people like me, but do you think the Republicans can make an impact in the country as a whole? And do you think there's a, a genuine shot for a Republican to defeat Hillary Clinton in 2016? Oh, I really do. I you think, do? Oh, yeah. You I, I think you the reason... It. You taste that one. Yeah, I, I definitely believe it because his numbers are better because the economy's gotten, gotten better, but it's getting better in spite of them. I mean, look... What will make this economy go is regulatory relief, not more regulation. Tax reform that lowers the rates and broadens the base. Um, getting on top of our debt and deficit. Balanced budget amendment. The right kind of energy plan. More choice and competition in health care. Strong support for our military. The things we've been talking about. The people know that. And that's the agenda we're pushing. And we're going to push it every single day for the next two years. And we're not just going to push it in Congress. You're going to see governors across this country push it. And I believe that's what the people of this country want. And so I, yes, I, I mean, I think very likely, um, you know, Hillary Clinton will be the Democrat nominee and something else could happen, but that's the great likelihood. Right. But I'll tell you what, we're going to have a lot of candidates and they're going to be good candidates. Yes. And that's going to be the message. And I truly believe that's what will move our country forward. And that's what Americans want. All these people are your friends, so I'm not going to ask you to name names. But you served 10 years as a governor. And right. you've now served almost six years. You're in your sixth year as a member of the United States Senate. Fifth. Fifth year. In the abstract, not naming names, not getting into personalities, just talking about the background. Would you rather see a governor win the GOP nomination for president or a senator? Well, first off, this is wide open. I have no idea who our nominee is going to be. We have a lot of great candidates with different backgrounds. So I'm not in any way I'm, right. picking you know, who it's going to be yet. Right. But, you know, I was a governor for a decade, so I'm biased there. I think governors bring a lot to the table uh, because of the background and the work they do. So we're going to have some great candidates that are governors or have been governors, and I think, you know, very likely one of them could be the nominee. That being said, there are others in this mix that bring a great skill set, too. So it's wide open. I have no idea who it's going to be, but I but like, like our governors. chances. All right. Last question, Senator. You gave up banking... 15 years ago. That's a decade and a half when you could have been enjoying a banker's income and participating in the boom back home in North Dakota. For that matter, you're still young enough to go home. At least I hope so. We're the same age. You're still young <laughs> enough. Care. Yeah, you, we're not that young anymore. <laughs> you could go home. And instead, here you are. You've served as governor for a decade. You've been in the Senate for your coming to the tail end of your first term. Mm -hmm. You have said, I don't think you've made a formal announcement, but you have said here and there that you plan to run for re-election right. next year. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in politics, Governor? What are you sticking with it for? It, you know, to me, this is the work that really matters. This is the challenge I want. Um, I care about it. I care about our country. I'm excited about what our state is doing, what North Dakota is doing. I mean, we're the fastest growing state in the country. We have more jobs and people. People are coming there. That's very different than when I started. Uh, in 2000 in terms of where our state was and, and how it was doing. I'm excited about how well our state's doing, but I'm very concerned about our country. And so the things we're talking about, I think, can really work for this great country. And so for me, it, it's the work I want to do. And, and um, you know, you're it can be frustrating here, yeah. no doubt, but it, it's, it you're matters. Enjoying, you're enjoying yourself? Yeah, I believe now that Now that you're in the majority, and, and there's more such, scope? Yeah, and it, it is an honor to serve, Peter. It is an incredible honor to, to serve... Uh, the people of our great state and this great country. John Hoven, senior senator from North Dakota. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Great to be with you. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson.